she did took the ring right off her finger. Dearest Mabel, receiving your letter today with the picture sure made me feel good. This whole thing started with a desire to transport Beth's ashes to different parts of the globe. And I was just so sad, so I just prayed and I went to bed. I love you. I love you too. Every day, not just on Valentine's Day, people perform the most inspiring acts in the name of love like preserving the memories of their loved ones lost or sharing vows in a wedding that leaves guests breathless. I'm Kelly Sasso with Stitch, which is all about telling heartfelt stories from communities just like yours. And today it is all about love. As you know, Valentine's Day offers us a chance to express our feelings for the special people in our lives. And how we do that can take many forms. For the man in our first story, it started as a traditional box of chocolates that grew into a decades long tradition. It's stories like this that stitch together the American story. Here's Christina Watkins with more. For 39 years, Ron Kramer of Albuquerque kept up the same sweet Valentine's Day tradition. He's filled the same box with chocolates to give to his wife ever since 1979. It's the year he first knocked on Donna's door. He saw me first in my quilted bathroom. I was really and, sexy. And, and, <laughs> and, and what would you have on your feet? Oh, yeah. Big bird slippers. <laughs> the tradition started when Ron began dating Donna and asked if she would like chocolates for Valentine's Day. When Ron bought the chocolates, the store made him a very special offer. They said, now, if you bring this box back next year and you want to refill it, we won't charge you for the box. We'll just uh, charge you for the candy. From then on, Ron used the same box to bring sweets to his sweetheart. And as the years passed, the tradition became even more important. That's because Donna was diagnosed with dementia in 2014. She had to go into a home in August of uh, 2015, and that was probably the saddest day of her life. You're OK, man. You're okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. She's going to forget who I am. So enjoy every minute you can have with them, or they can still remember you. And even while her memory failed her, Donna still remembered the Valentine's Day tradition. He's a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't kicked him to the curb yet. So. Oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> that Valentine's Day in 2018 was the last time Ron brought chocolates to Donna. Just a few weeks later, she passed away at the age of 74. I love you. I love you too. A box of chocolate is a tradition grounded in history, but exactly how are they created? Erica Jensen, a chocolatier from rural Iowa, explains. You don't ever hear someone saying, oh, chocolate's dull. And everybody's like, chocolates? And I'm like, yeah, every day. My name is Erica Jensen, and I am a chocolatier at the chocolate season. I was working as a marketing associate, and I just wasn't feeling super fulfilled. And if you're going to do chocolate, you need to go to Europe. I basically ate my way through Europe, came up with concepts and passions that I had while I was there, and I decided to bring it back to the Midwest. You can't grow cacao in Iowa. You have to be within a certain amount of miles of the equator. My chocolate guy gives me access to chocolate from all over the world. I remember walking along the streets of Paris going, they have it figured out. They know how to balance life, and if chocolate and espresso every day is how they do it, I'm all in came to Algona because we really thought, what a gift to be able to give people in a rural community fine foods that they might not normally have access to. Chocolate is a very cruel mistress. The minute you get lazy and you don't check your temps, it will turn on you. You have to be patient. It takes a lot of care and thought. If you want to do bonbons, we hand clean a polycarbonate mold, and then you take cocoa butter that's been colored, and we hand paint every cavity. You have to let that set up. You have your tempered chocolate that you brought back into temper. You pipe in all the bonbon fillings. You let that crystallize. And then you take your tempered chocolate again, and you seal it, let that set up, and then you turn it out. And now you have a piece of chocolate. Every flavor I remember creating based on different events in my life. Some people get tattoos. I create chocolate. It's fun and it's challenging, but there's heartache when something doesn't go quite right. Even though you have failures and you're up till 1 a.m., the customer is like, oh, this must have been so effortless for you. And you're like, yeah, totally. <laughs> no problem at all. But because I loved it so much, it was so fun to see a challenge and overcome it or to create something that made people smile. I look forward to work every day because I'm like, what do I get to eat today? I don't know. I know I'll be doing this for 
basically the rest of my life. Our next story takes us to the Eastern Seaboard where love gets a little help from three strangers. Three sisters are always looking for their next big adventure and because of them, the next one may be a wedding. Sharon Heineman was in Boston with her sisters Jeannie Crow and Rita Blanchett when they stopped for lunch at a restaurant and met with their waiter, Mateo. When Mateo told them that he wanted to propose to his girlfriend, Maria, but couldn't afford a ring, Sharon stepped in. She gave Mateo a ring from her previous marriage right off of her finger. I just did it. He loved her and he didn't have her ring. <laughs> Maria said yes, and the restaurant picked up the sister's tab. And the sisters even earned themselves an invitation to Maria and Mateo's big day. And she said, yes, yes, Mateo. Who's going to the wedding? We are. <laughs> Ever since that fateful encounter, the sisters have stayed in touch with Maria and Mateo, returning to visit them at the restaurant, staying up to speed on their wedding planning. Using Sharon's ring, Maria was even able to design one of her own, which we're told Sharon got a real thrill out of. Our next story out of Kentucky is a bit of a mystery that maybe you can help solve. One woman uncovered a romantic exchange from the past inside of her late grandfather's barn. Kimberly Gentry found a box that contained dozens of love letters that were sent between a couple during World War II. She discovered from the letters that Russell Hash was a private in the U.S. Army and that he and Mabel eventually got married. Dearest Mabel, receiving your letter today with the picture sure made me feel good. Most of the years are 1941, 1942, and it's all over the country where he's traveling. Many pictures were included with the letters, and everything is in excellent condition, despite it being behind other items inside of that barn. I wonder if they had kids, you know, where they're at now, if, you know, what, what their lives were like. And, you know, if she had this box and this was, you know, special to her and she just lost it somehow. Kimberly doesn't have a Russell or a Mabel in her family, so she's looking for someone who does. She's hoping to find them so she can give the box mementos back to that couple's family. I really hope they're still alive and I can beat them one day. Just hand them back to them and say, here, I hope these mean as much to you as they have me. After several months, Kimberly has yet to find any surviving family members of Russell or Mabel. If you know any of their relatives, contact us at Stitch at Hearst.com. When it comes to love letters in the 21st century, is the connection lost in the digital message? This calligrapher teaches others how to harness their handwriting to create beautiful script. It's a skill, it's an art form. I love being able to put it in other people's hands, literally, and watch their creativity grow. My name is Courtney Matern. I'm the Omaha artist and creator of Pleasant Avenue Paper Company. I specialize in calligraphy design and other hand-painted happy things. One of the very first shops that carried my designs had approached me once about teaching a calligraphy class. And what sets my classes apart is that I focus strictly on modern calligraphy. The traditional styles are really rigid, but the modern style really embraces creativity. Modern calligraphy could also encompass hand lettering and brush lettering, which you can use a variety of different markers or brushes that give you the same look of thin and thick strokes. Think back to that grid that you learned how to write your first letters on. You have your baseline where your letters sit, the X height, which is where your lowercase letters come up to, the space for your ascenders and descenders. A lot of students who start out, they want to go as fast as writing cursive, Cursive and calligraphy are two different things. You are picking up your hand and you're going slow and you're being intentional in your stroke. So it should be about half the speed of your regular handwriting. I always tell my students, practice makes progress. The more you practice, the better you're gonna get, the more you're gonna learn about yourself and your style. You can make your letters different shapes and sizes. So the rules are definitely important, but there should be no fear in breaking them. Every day we're bombarded by technology. We need to connect more with each other and there's nothing more special or simple as picking up a pen, writing someone a letter, sending it off in the mail. When I was a little girl, I kept every card my grandma gave me. The personal connection is important and it's something to value. Polygraphy for me is super relaxing. I'm not really thinking, it's very intuitive. I just let myself go free.
Welcome back to our medley of love stories. For Marvin Giordana, a love of nature and the planet drives his unique connection to a being many of us probably take for granted. There's this different kind of consciousness. It doesn't look like us, but this is a being that needs to be respected. People are disconnected with nature, especially living in the city. When people come here, they're forced to slow their thoughts down and focus just on the bees. I think it's an innate fear to be afraid of bees. I want to dispel that and have people come with a different perspective. My movements are really slow. It's almost like Tai Chi movements because the bees need to know that you're not scared. They will sense your fear. They will sense your anxiety. I don't take the honey because if I take their honey, I'm taking their food. Commercial beekeeping is a necessary thing. It must be done. But those bees have to be fed sugar syrup, miticides, fungicides in order for them to thrive. They're treated like cattle. But also, without that, our food would be very, very expensive. It takes the work of 26 humans to do the job of one bee. It's a very important species. Like, it's here for a reason. They make these perfect hexagons. In nature, that shape is perfect. And that means they vibrate at a very high frequency. When you look at water molecules, like microscopically, they all just shape like hexagons and crystalline in structure. They're vibrating in a very high frequency of love and healing. And this to me is amazing. I've never even wanted to be a beekeeper. This wasn't something that I chose, yet they chose me. Marvin reminds us that bees keep our planet vibrant and alive, sustaining our existence. The late Dr. Maya Angela once said that I sustain myself with the love of family. And as you'll see from the super centurion in the next story, Dr. Angela may have been onto something. Ethel Bowens, Oklahoma's oldest woman, received more than 3,000 cards for her birthday in 2019. I'm 110 years old. Needless to say, things have changed a lot in her very long lifetime. She had a living on the farm. Mm -hmm. and didn't have to go to the store for everything. Ethel and her husband were married for 65 years. She says their relationship is her secret to a long life. Oh, he was a nice man. He never wanted me to work. He, I stayed in the house and took care of it. Ethel raised six kids, cooked three meals a day, cleaned the house, and sewed her family's clothes. And get this, she also played piano at her church and taught Sunday school, passing her faith on to her family, her very large and growing family. A total of 128 grandchildren, 29 grandchildren, 54 great-grand, and 45 great great grandchildren and more to come. It showed that I've lived a good life mm -hmm. for so many people to take care of me. What a legacy and a life Ethel witnessed. Even a life cut short can experience boundless love though. Our next story is about a man finding his way through a maze of grief. For Tim Guthrie, the phrase dying of a broken heart wasn't just a corny romantic cliche. For him, it felt like a real possibility. After his wife, Beth, died at the age of 49, They've been together for 25 years. So to cope with his grief, the Omaha native undertook a beautiful journey to recapture some of their moments together. Beth passed away about a year ago. She suffered from a handful of different things. She didn't like talking about it, so I don't know if she'd want me talking about it. This whole thing started with a desire to transport some of Beth's ashes to different parts of the globe, um, different areas. We did their travel together, um, went to on her honeymoon, or places that I thought she might enjoy. It's just this process I'm going through. I started taking photos when I was going to some of these locations, taking photos of photos from when we were there. To me, it's actually being in the place, returning to some of those places, reconnecting with those memories. That's what's important to me, not the image itself. If I don't get a perfect image, I actually sometimes don't even really care. I'm more excited to find the location and actually get to stand there again. Every once in a while, somebody will tell me that it feels like maybe Beth is leading me to these spots, helping me find them. I uh, often feel so broken in my faith and a lot of things that to believe that uh, 
is a stretch for me. It's kind of a depressing answer, but that's the honest answer. <laughs> I'd stopped making art years ago to help take care of her, so I was already away from the art community already. I really, really hate uh, thinking of reducing Beth to an art project. It's just me trying to get through everything. I'm not, I don't really, I don't, I don't think of it as a project. <laughs> Each one of these has an image of her. And it's filled with her ashes. So it actually has her ashes in it. And these are what I'm burying in uh, different locations. I got there and lined it up. It was so easy to line up perfectly that you, know, you take the photograph down and you just, you wanna see her actually standing there. Welcome back. We now turn our attention to stories of the unexpected because love, just like life, is full of surprises. What follows are stories of the unlikely, unreal, and one in a million. A wedding that takes love to new heights and the depths plumbed literally to retrieve a lost engagement ring. An unusual bunch of coincidences shared by one couple and a rare bond forged between surprising companions. Two professional highliners tied the knot suspended 400 feet above the ground in Moab, Utah. Kimberly Weglin and Ryan Jinx said they wanted to pay homage to the way they first fell in love at a sack lining festival. Kimberly said the friends, of course, they were thrilled to hear the news, but when the time came to step foot on the net, it was a bit of a different story. As the father of the bride followed his daughter down the net pathway, he stumbled and he fell, but thankfully, he regained his balance. He was also safely secured by a line. So after the vows, eight men base jumped off the cliff, flower petals shooting from their parachutes. A little bit out of the ordinary, sure, but Ryan says, remember this. But if it's something you love with yeah. people you love, yeah. it'll be amazing. Our next story from Florida is about a woman who lost something that she loved dearly. Gina Henkin is now a believer in miracles after she accidentally flushed her wedding ring down the toilet. Oh no, I just started crying. It was the ring that her husband Steve gave her 30 years ago when they were married. I've never seen anybody that upset before. She was hysterical. Steve opened up the sewer cleanouts running from the house to try to find the ring. Steve then contacted the public works department, which told him that searching the sewer was gonna be a long shot. But after a technician jumped down a 20-foot manhole, he emerged with the ring. <laughs> I started crying all over again. I was so, can you believe? I mean, that is a one in a million thing. I never thought I was gonna see this ring again. And you know, speaking of one in a million, this Louisiana couple's love story is really almost too hard to believe. Their relationship started like many modern stories, meeting on a dating app, but it really began on the day they were born. Jamie France and Anthony Burkett started texting each other more than three years ago and soon found out they were both born on January 14th, 1993 and at the same hospital. Well, we really did meet, you know, 25 years ago when we were born. Uh -huh. Anthony, just six hours older than Jamie, and the two may have been doors away from each other when they were born. Coincidentally, they also both weighed eight pounds, seven ounces, and they're left-handed. So sharing a birthday brought their families closer too. We always talk about our fathers. They were probably right next to each other looking at us in the nursery and they didn't even realize it. After we were dating our first birthday together, we had just had a joint family birthday. It was so cool. We actually met each other's parents and our parents were more involved with, with us yeah. way earlier on as a result of having the same birthday. For the next chapter in their story, Jamie and Anthony wed in April, 2018. How does love begin, y'all? Now I've got to confess. I've done some intensive research on this. Can it begin at birth in the same hospital, being born only six hours apart? Maybe they were in the same nursery, you know, and they were just laying just the right way, gazing into each other's eyes. 
Love, after all, is a mysterious thing. It happens at just the right time and in just the right place. Try and look back on how it all started. It just seems like it came together. Jamie and Anthony, your lives fit together perfectly. Y'all, this is not by accident. I present to you Mr. and Mrs. Burkett. You may kiss the bride. Jamie and Anthony tell us they've been loving the married life and clearly their similarities brought them together. But the companions in our next clip show us how opposites can attract. Take a look at these furry friends from Florida. They have more in common than you may think. Chico the dog and Coco the cat both experienced neglect and abuse. They became the best of friends at the shelter where they were recovering. He just was like protecting the dog. So we look at each other and says, well, we can separate them. The Freitas family adopted both Chico and Coco to keep them together. The family says the two animals are inseparable. We had the most beautiful moments with them. We haven't laughed so much in their entire year than this two past weeks. How cute is that? You can catch more inspiring stories just like these at watchstitch.com. And if you have a story of your own you'd like to share, email us at stitchathearst.com. Send us your photos and videos, and we may feature them right here or on one of our social channels. From all of us at Stitch, have a very happy Valentine's Day, and thanks for watching.